Hey everyone, welcome to the Story Studio podcast. And I think, I think, I was thinking about this recently. I think this is the first Story Studio podcast with a guest. No, that can't be. Who else is it? Who else is there? Oh no, I'm sorry. We had Bonnie. We had those we ones had, with Bonnie. But rock, I think a Bonnie actually. is like because she's part of the family. But you're oh, right. you just I mean, told that, Dave he's not family, dude. You're starting this all <laughs> off wrong. <laughs> like, oh, I mean <laughs> family in the way that. Well, we I bring a guest that. on, and then you, you say he's not family. Dave, I apologize for my partner's <laughs> behavior. That's so dismissive of you. <laughs> Bonnie works for the company. This is our first guest in a while named Dave since David Goggern, I believe. Uh, yes. That's an excellent point, Dave. Right. Thank you for pointing <laughs> Good one, Dave. All right. So, um, so anyway. So, so really so- what you're trying to say is only Daves are invited in your show unless they're Bonnie. Uh, pretty much, yeah. That, oh, that sounds. That sounds. I think right. that's a good policy. A, a firm Dave only policy. Um, so anyway, so, so today's guest is um, Dave Lacani, and um, Dave, I'm gonna I'm gonna give the way that we know you, and then you can maybe fill in any gaps as far as you know credentials or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. um, so this is kind of funny because uh, Sean and I belong to a mastermind, and um, that we went to it just like a month ago, something like that, and um, a mutual friend. Uh, I think it was. I think it must have been Lovich because he does that intro bombs. Oh, he's, he's the talking. intro bomb king. Yeah. 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 Have you guys met? Talk. Boom! You guys are going to be on a. You guys are going to be on a panel. Go! And so we were like, okay. And so we were just kind of sitting around and and um and we were going to be on a little like storytelling panel for the mastermind the next day, and um and then you know we got to know each other just a little bit and then did the panel and it was like oh okay well we're really on the same um on the same wavelength here. And uh, what was funny is that when we got it for the panel, it was like, okay, so let's, you know, introducing Johnny, Sean, and Dave, go. And so we did that. And um, he does fill in well for our Dave. So it was, it was a good swap. It was, uh, some people didn't notice the difference. And- <laughs> <laughs> they, they, ha- they both have enough hate to carry, you know, their fair third for sure. Um, but... The, I think the important thing for, uh, oh, and Dave's going to speak at the summit. So um, Smarter Artist Which one? Summit. Be more com. specific, Johnny. SmarterArtistSummit.com. Those tickets are on sale now. Um, he's one of our speakers and he's going to talk Dave, about- Dave, would you like to talk about how many Daves have spoken at the summit before? <laughs> <laughs> well, he can speak instead of me since I don't like speaking. This will be the third Dave at the summit. Um, but, but, but Dave knows a ton about persuasion, specifically pers- persuasion in storytelling, how to persuade with stories. And, um, and then a bunch of kind of cool tidbits that I'm going to let you fill in because I don't want to ruin the punchline. And by the way, everybody listening, our Dave hasn't heard a lot of this yet. And so I want to get his reaction live because this is kind of fun. So what are some of the unusual things that have occurred <laughs> in your life, Dave Lacani? First of all, oh, and welcome. Like there's that whole thing too. Thanks yeah, thank me. you. Thanks for having me. It's awesome to be here. And I'm, I'm super stoked to be with you guys again. It was great. Um, being where we were and uh, and having that opportunity to um, speak to a group together for the first time and being thrown into the mix that way, um, <laughs> probably the thing that people find uh, that people find it most um, interesting about my background is that I was raised in a religious cult from the time I was six until I was sixteen years old, and you know that usually is one of those moments you say that and people are like, hold on, wait a minute, did you say a cult? In, in 49 of the 50 states. In California, the answer is always like, whoa, which one? Which one? <laughs> and so, that was actually I, my I question. <laughs> so, no, they, they, but that is the truth. So I was raised in a religious cult from the time I was six until I was 16. They believed in no education past sixth or seventh grade. Women had to be subservient to their husbands or corporal punishment was allowed. Um, there was no television, no radio, no listening to music, movies. Um, a very fundamentalist Christian cult that believed in an end time prophet named William Branham. And that's the name of the cult for those people that are going to go Google it. They're called Branhamites, <laughs> or you can go look up the prophet William Branham. Dave's already on his way. Yeah, yep. exactly. <laughs> and so was it uh, a sex cult? Did he have sex with many <laughs> underage girls? Cause that's usually what those cults revolve around. <laughs> well, there, there's some question about him personally because he died in 1965, the same year I was born. And uh, are you, son, you him? <laughs> reincarnated it, it's possible that is that that is one possibility um so the you know so during that time um i you know it would, you know when i was like literally six seven years old i would walk around and you know we we, we used to hand out these tracts and tracts for these little comics for christians i love uh, tracts yeah they're great and so you would hand them out to people dave's so happy right now 
uh, yeah. And so I would, I would hand those out. And then, and then as I got just a little bit older, probably about seven, eight, um, I would, I would walk up to, you know, to people, particularly women, because at that time I had like, you know, big brown eyes and long black and not long hair, but because you weren't allowed to have long hair, you could only have short hair if you were a man, long hair if you were a woman. Women could not wear any garment pertaining to a man, so no pants. But I would walk up to these, I would walk up to women and I would say, you look like such a lovely person, such a beautiful woman. I bet you are probably the best sister, the best mom ever. And I, I just wish you were my mom. There's only one problem. And they would always say inevitably, oh, what's the problem? And I would say, so you're going to hell, Jezebel, with your bobbed hair. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be my intro. And so that would be, you know. Wow. Where, yeah, right. <laughs> So it's very polarizing, as you might imagine. And so and, and, your tribe right from the start, right from the start. <laughs> know but your it, audience but it also, but it also sort of like split between like, you know, if they were 40 and younger and 40 and over, if they were like 40 and, and younger, you know, that was one thing, but the, you know, the, the 40 and youngers would be like, Oh my God, what did you just say? Did you just call me Jezebel? And where, where's your mother? I, you know, well, I, I, and then they would bring me over to my mom and they'd be like, um, uh, your son just said this thing to me. And she would say, you know, it, which was great because the whole idea was, you know, to get him over to mom because mom was the closer. And so. And tell they, me, does this smell like chloroform? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, and then if they were 40 or over, another thing happened. And, and that thing was they would slap you very hard across your face for, you know, saying they looked whorish and were, you know, Jezebel. And then they would take you to your mom, which was also a good outcome because, as I mentioned, mom was the closer. So that was the that was the way that I got that I was raised until I was 16 years old. I was, uh, you know, I was ministering by the time I was, you know, 13, 14 years old. And by the time I was yeah, by the time I was 10 or 11, to be really honest, I, I was already seeing cracks in the system and why it didn't work. And by the time I was 16, I knew I had to leave because I was going to probably either caused my family so much harm in the organization um, that it would be just unbearable for them or I would probably end up in jail. And so um, I was, you know, I was very actively resisting them. The deacons, my brother um, had ADHD, which meant that he had been possessed by Satan. Yeah. Life. I was about to say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> obviously. And so obviously, right. And so the best way as it turns out to get Satan out is to <clears throat> young kids. And yeah. that was what they did to him on a very regular basis. And by the time I was 13 or 14, I was intervening and, you know, so that was turning ugly. And that's, that, that was one of the prison paths. And then the other one was, and the really sad part about this organization, and I don't want to take up the whole time talking about this is most of the people I grew up with, about 50% of them have either committed suicide or have um, become, you know, very, very aggressive drug and alcohol addicts and that kind of thing. The other 50% kind of like 10 or 15% went my direction, which was to, you know, figure your way out. And the other ones kind of bounced back and forth or found some other fundamentalist, you know, religion or they stayed in. So Wow, 50%. That is a hell of a ratio. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I wouldn't apologize for talking about that at all because I think it, it kind of made you who you are. And what's your day job? Indeed. What, what, yeah, what, so, what's your, yeah. Well, so, so when I finally left the organization, I'll just tell that story because it really transitions into that. Um, I, I, I've told my mom, like, I can't go anymore. She said, great, you have to go tell the minister that you're leaving. And I said, okay, fine. And then they brought me up to the pulpit for the last time. And the deacons and the ministers all laid their hands on me and prayed to God that he would turn my soul over to Satan for the destruction of my flesh and that I would be killed for my family. <laughs> well, at least they didn't uh, hold it against you. <laughs> no, no. They, I mean, you know, it was thoughtful. But uh, they... Um, did you yeah, have to wait in line for that or did you, did you <laughs> skip right to the front? I only, yeah, I was the only one that day. So... Um, so I went, I, by the way, I got to say just how happy I am to be hearing this story. <laughs> <laughs> You're confirming guy. his worldview, which, yes, which yeah. he really likes. Exactly. exactly. We knew, we I mean, knew. I'm sorry you went through all this, but there's a part of me that's like, yeah, very Dave, pleased right? this is for our listeners and for you. We really did gift wrap this. Thank you. <laughs> so go on. No, no. So, so, you know, when that happened, um, I was also excommunicated from the church and my family that my family wasn't allowed to have anything to do with me anymore I with them and and so for some years I didn't talk to my mother and I left and over those ensuing years you know um, it, it wasn't all good and it wasn't all bad but there were some you know there were a few times I thought their prayers were working but um, you know and, and so I left that but the the first place that I went 
which is probably relevant to all of the listeners here, simply because they're, they're writers and, and people who spend a lot of time with books. The only thing they'd never said in the cult you couldn't do was go to the library. And my mom was an educated woman. She wasn't, she wasn't dumb by any means. Um, she'd met my father at UC Berkeley. And so she, you know, she was an educated woman and she was a smart woman, but they never said you couldn't go to the library. And so mom would always let us go to the library and we would just check out all the books we wanted. And, you know, at one point I, I literally had a certificate because this was an old Carnegie public library in a very small town that I checked out all the books that they could see in the, you know, in the adult nonfiction section. And so I just, I read constantly. That's did you ever I go did. to the photography section? Cause that's the where book. I used to see boobs. Like <laughs> I, I, I may have done that. When I, was I, I, I knew, I, I knew where all the boobs were. No, that's the best place. B Dalton, Walden's, yeah. they always had the photography section with yeah. the boobs. Yeah, exactly. Good. Or drawing. There's always yeah. some there too, you know, <laughs> live models. But um, so I, so I, you know, I went and I had, had just been this voracious reader and, and studier. And so when I left, I, I went to the only place that I'd ever found solace or any sort of sense in the world. And that was the Carnegie Public Library in Caldwell, Idaho. And that's when I figured out, you know, I said, look, I've got to figure this thing out. How did my mom, you know, let her oldest son just go like that? And, and how did they pull her in and keep her there? So I began studying persuasion, manipulation, human influence, psychology of belief, heuristics of decision making. And I started then and that study has continued on now for some, you know, 35 years. And over that time, I I learned a few things about persuasion and and became an an expert in applied persuasion. So there's a lot of, you know, there's theoretical persuasion. This is how people act and people who do research and that kind of thing. And my expertise is really around how do you take all of that information and turn it into something usable? And so that's, you know, that, that's where my real level of expertise so is. So basically you wanted to become a Jedi instead of a Sith once yeah, you learned it, to use the force. <laughs> exactly. And, and I, I, you know, one of the big distinctions I make around that is simply, you know, if, if you, if you look at the really technical definition of persuasion, it's any attempt to change someone's mind, which is also the definition of manipulation, any attempt to change someone's mind technically is manipulation. And so the whole idea here is what is, you know, what is the real difference between persuasion and manipulation? And it comes down to your intent. What do you hope to do with this thing? Are you hoping to just, you know, leverage it? And, you know, we, we see right now playing out in U- U- U.S. politics, regardless of which side you're on, we, you know, we see some of the, the most blatant uses of manipulation we've ever seen. Some of the most blatant uses of propaganda and those kinds of fake things. news. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, you know, when we see those things, it's really interesting to watch them play out. But one of the important things for people on this podcast is so much of that is done in persuasive narrative. So in the, the writing that's being done, this, you know, the, um, the speeches that are being written for other people that are then being used, uh, all of those kinds of things are very carefully crafted in order to get a kind of response that they want. And unfortunately, persuasion and manipulation are um, they're, they're, they, they go very hand in hand. Many of the same techniques work both directions. Again, it comes down to your intent. The difference really though is, is that at some point, manipulation is always discovered. And once it is, it never feels good and people are unhappy. Yeah, I mean, I, I, of course, in, in that context, manipulation is an ugly word. But for us, right. like that's our job, right? Yeah, we absolutely. are manipulators. We have to manipulate the reader every single step of the way. Great filmmakers are to like, their mind. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You're like a, a book is an argument and we're saying, okay, mm-hmm. we're going to force you to believe this Within thing. the story and off page. So you're trying, you're doing emotional manipulation through the story. You're trying to make people feel or believe a certain way, but then also between books, you're trying to get them to act and, you know, join my little reader cult essentially. And, yeah, uh, absolutely. The next book. Yep. Absolutely. If, if, and if you're doing it well, they do, right. They, you know, they can't wait for the next book. They can't, they don't even mind if you branch out a little bit, you know? Well, the thing about a cult is that they like, everything's better when it's your idea, right? Yeah. But if the cult can make you believe it's your idea, you're not just doing it. You're, you're doing it because it's important to you. It's meaningful. Right. It's not being done to you. It's being done with you. And that's, that's the thing, you know, you become part of this community and, and that's, you're exactly right. That's very true of real cults is that, you know, they've created a community that you're a part of and they've done something else also very important is they've, they've, they've segmented you away from the rest of the real world. And so, you know, they, they be, you know, they've pushed you sort of out of that sense that, you know, of, you know, there are other people who are also okay and it becomes us versus them. 
Well, yeah, it's like when um, Seth Godin pissed everybody off because he called his book um, All Marketers, All Marketers are, liars. are Liars, which yeah. I wish he would have been strong enough to just hang yes, on. Yes, because that is a great title. It's a great title. And that kind of polarization matters, right? It didn't, it, not one of his true fans cared. Oh, and no. Who, and the people who, you know, had been kind of sitting on the edge were like, oh, yeah. Yeah, right, and, and that. all that, that just makes me like the guy. But right. I did like him less for changing it because, yeah. yes, if, all marketers well, are liars. Sort of gave in to social pressure. Yeah, he <laughs> changed it to all marketers tell stories for those of you who don't know that. Okay, so. but, but that's pussy. No, like, it, it doesn't just work. Is. No, 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 <laughs> like, it just yeah. is. No, so all marketers thing. are liars is, is a fantastic title. And like there's, there's truth in that, and that's why it's wonderful. Lie doesn't have to be a wrong, a bad word. I am a liar. You know, well, look I don't at, tell look at the way Ryan family. Holiday did it with um, Trust Me, I'm Lying. Trust Me, I'm Lying. Yeah. Like, that's perfect. Yeah. That really says what that book is. Right. Like, we're all honorable family men who don't, don't tell lies outside of our stories. But in our stories, we're constantly lying. We, like, we, our favorite thing to do is put an unreliable narr narrator in there where we're lying to our reader for most of the story. Like, that's fun. But it's not, it's not duplicitous or disingenuous or or you no, know because everybody knows like in in the context they know it's true, right yeah. you know but that's also why persuasive narrative works so well in persuasive fiction so when people you know write these pieces of persuasive fiction they're very often times and, and they're a lot often shorter format than longer format but they're they're really designed to sort of instill a worldview that might be new and they do that very easily because people are willing to suspend disbelief and they're already used to accepting our lies what are Absolutely. the keys to that, Dave? Because, um, I mean, once you buy into something a little bit, then that's like that cognitive dissonance thing and you have to, you, you have to generate reasons that you were right, that you weren't wrong for making that choice. Um, so what are the keys to sort of persuading people and in kind of that inception approach versus like, boom, you will believe this? Right. So it's, so it's, it's starting where that, and by the way, I, I want to, I'm, I'm going to come back to that, but I want to get back to one point that you were talking about, about Seth Godin. It's this whole idea of polarization, right? Only polarized people buy things, including ideas. And so you can't let people just stay on the fence, right? You have to push them off the fence because the only thing you get on the fence is slivers in your crotch. And Seth Godin did a really great job of pushing them off the fence and then picking them all up and setting them back on the fence. Right. <laughs> and, and, and that doesn't really work. So, it, it, but to back to your question though, about how do you make these, these pieces of fiction or these narratives very persuasive? Number one, you, you know, you start out in the ordinary world that people live in or the ordinary world that they believe is coming. So like, I believe that this thing could happen or this thing may be happening or there's this conspiracy or there's this other thing that exists around it. So, you know, conspiracy theories are the best examples of this, whether they're intentional or unintentional, right? Whether, whether just people believe crazy things or somebody in the background is actually controlling the strings and generally there's more of that than, than the former. And so when, so when you look at something like that, you say, what is, what is this ordinary world that these people live in and how do I best demonstrate in this story that I'm like them? that this place is like them, that these characters are like them, that they're having the same thoughts, right? So you're mind reading these people a little bit and saying, oh, this person has this thought, which by the way, is just like mine. When I read this book, I've had that very thought, you know, and I have this very experience of doing that. That's, that's the thing that sort of sets the tone. And instead of saying this whole new world exists that you've never heard of before, and it's real, and I'm telling you it's real, people are like, yeah, that's BS. But if you take them gently into this new place, where they already exist or live or have at least conceived of at some point, they're open to very much what might happen there. So the best lies are 90% true. I used to years ago be an undercover police officer um, and bought drugs. And so one of the big things you have to do there- are those is, two separate things or are those one <laughs> combined thing? They, 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 they may or may not be either or. <laughs> okay. So yeah, generally combined though. Um, so I would, I would go and buy drugs, but when you're, when you're setting up a, you, you know, you're, when you're setting, you have to set up a background, right? You have to create a legend for these people. People have to be able to know, like, where did you come from? And, and, you know, is there something there? And so if I was working on a task force in, you know, San Antonio, Texas, and hadn't lived in San Antonio, Texas, and grew up there and hadn't been there for some time, I had to have very quantifiable you know, things that I could say that I would know about San Antonio. And I would try and find two or three things that I knew were hot buttons and two or three things many people didn't know about 
and a couple of controversial things that I could take a stand on, right? So when people talk to me, I would have all of the checks checked off when they talk to me like, oh yeah, he, oh, you were back there in 1983 and you saw this thing happen. You know, yeah, you were, you were in San Antonio. You, you know about San Antonio, right? So you're, you're real. And that's that same thing. That's that, that ordinary world that I was entering of theirs. I could speak their language in a way that was meaningful. So that's that first part is creating that construct that allows them to seamlessly interact with you without having to wonder, are you different? Because that's what really works with cults and it's what really works with brands and it's what really, really works with stories is creating this language that we speak together. It's our own unique language and so we can recognize each other in the dark. So I, I would imagine that even if you by now, like in one of your series, if you said, oh, this book was, you know, you decided to ghostwrite it, or, you know, not ghostwrite it, but you decide to use a pen name and say it wasn't you that wrote this installment of this thing, somebody would read it and go, that's bullshit, that's not real. They would know immediately, right? <laughs> because they know the language, right? They would know that that's true. On the well, other hand, I'm um, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Well, just on the other hand, people who didn't know the language would, might easily believe that someone else did this too. Well, it's within your books too, within your worlds and your stories. And the more you have language that feels like it's part of that world, like your whole world could be a little cult because they all speak yep. the same language. Right. So right now I'm, I'm listening to Dead City, which did something Johnny and I wrote a few years ago. And we're prepping to kind of like go back to that well at some point. Mm -hmm. And I'm listening to it. And my favorite thing about it so far is exactly that the amount of vocabulary that is unique to that world that makes it feel like, I mean, we only have one book in that world and yet anybody reading that has got to be thinking there's, there's more here, like there's more here. And it's because the language is so, um, I don't know, what's the word consistent or? Like, well, and it's also worth pointing out that you're talking about shared, it, it, it is language, but it's also not. It's like there, there are drugs with names that exist. There's, um, uh, casts of different, like different kinds of police officers that are called special things because they work in that area. There's um, a whole thing of like, because Dead City is a zombie society book. So there's like zombie normalization stuff. But um, I actually find it a little distracting, although we've, uh, some people do this where they actually literally will change the language. Like I remember trying to read Clockwork. Cloud Atlas and, like, or something. Yeah. The Cloud Atlas really just like, okay, that's, that's too hard for me. The shit you tried to make me do with the beam. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think you're talking about a shared vocabulary, maybe more shared than vocabulary yeah. than, than, than an actual new language. Right. But it is. Yeah. So it's a shared vocabulary, but it is a shared language in the sense that it's a way that they communicate in shorthand with each other. Right. So they, you know, like it was when, when I was in a cult, if I said the world, everybody knew what I was talking about and it wasn't the round thing orbiting the sun. Right. It was the world, everybody, but us, those worldly people that were going to hell. And so it's that sort of idea, the way you use your vocabulary and the, the definition that you give to the words that really matters. Then the next step is to, to acknowledge things in existence that, that people can also recognize, right? So if I say, you know, if I was writing a story, of, I, I live in Boise, Idaho, right? So if I said something, I might put a landmark there, like the Boise train depot or you know, I'm a, or, or if I was being even more subtle, I would talk about the Basque community. We have a giant Basque community here, largest one outside of Spain. And so we might, you know, you might talk about those kinds of things because people will be like, yeah, I know that's true, right? So what you're trying to do is give them enough truth, right? Get, try and get them around that 90% level where everything that they're reading are going, yeah, 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 I agree with this. I know this. this. This feels normal to me. This feels right and it feels comfortable. And then you're introducing the lie, right? The lie is whatever, whatever it is, right? But you're introducing this thing that you're saying is an integral part of the story, but it doesn't feel untrue because it, it, it A, matches up with the original or, or their ordinary world. It matches up with the things that they imagine that are there. And so whether you're talking about things like a, like a landmark or you're talking about things like, you know, aliens in Arizona, these are things that exist that people either believe or don't believe already. And as long as you connect back to those things that they find real, they, they buy it instantly. And then all you do is build on those things that they want to be true, right? So they, there, there are things that have to be true, but then you build on the things they want to be true. Whether it's whether they know they're suspending reality for a moment, right? But what gets them to suspend- Is that how you stay married, Dave? Yes. <laughs> the other day. <Dave. laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> by suspending reality. <laughs> <laughs> or throwing into a different branch of reality. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think they call that, oh, never mind. Um, that, yeah. So it's, but, but it is that whole idea that, you know, if you can get them to do that, then they'll begin to expand that reality and they'll, they'll more easily accept that if you've already told them a bunch of truths, that this other thing is also possibly true as well. Because it doesn't have to be 100% true. It only has to be plausible. Now, just, just to rewind a bit, we, 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 we skipped over where you went after, after the cult and, uh, you know, what, what you're doing now. So uh, yeah. let's rewind a bit. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, you know, so after, after the cult, I, um, I you know, I, so I, I had sort of a, a, you know, a significant part of my life that was not, I, I was really, you know, I, I didn't have any, any way of managing in the real world. I mean, I, I had not left school. That was one of the other issues that they had. I, every time they would say, okay, it's time to leave school. I'd say, okay, great. I just need to go tell my principal uh, why I'm leaving and that kind of thing. And they flinched the first time I said it. And I realized, aha, okay, you guys don't really want to be seen. And so, so that was sort of my lever. But by the time I was 16, I left. And when I left, I lived in my car for a while and still went to high school. And, you know, I graduated a year early. I figured out how to do that and graduated a year early. Um, but the way I made my money, uh, was by fighting. Um, I already learned how to take the best beating men could give me. And, uh, <laughs> so I was, uh, I, I made my, I so had our Dave, but in a different way, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get paid for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I often didn't either. And so that was, that, that was the other problem. So I was headed down a not great path. Um, and, uh, but I did, uh, you know, I did get picked up, um, to fight professionally and that was that was sort of a, a little bit of a turning point for me and so I did stand up kickboxing and that kind of thing but I was still making more money doing barn fights honestly where you just got you know it was like human dog fights I don't know if you can find a way to fit it into the story but if you can can, can tell the story about the time you got your ass handed to you oh. that shit's pretty rad <laughs> yeah it's a, I mean it's a simple story I'll tell it really quickly so I was fighting professionally and uh, and, I was, and I was also you know I, I, I was sponsored by a beer company and uh, I was you know I, I was uh, I, you know not supposed to drink I was 17 years old but nobody really put that fine of a line around it for me and uh, I, I was drunk or drinking anyway I wouldn't say I was fully drunk I was pretty good buzz though and I uh, had a couple buddies with me and we were driving um, up in the uh, up in the foothills here in some housing area and I went around a corner too fast and slid into someone's lawn who had just put sod down and uh, <laughs> I, I, I dropped the <laughs> dropped the gear and, and hit the gas real hard and threw their sod like all over the side of their house and this guy comes out and he's just livid right and he's calling me everything but his redheaded stepchild he's pissed and and rightfully so as a 53 year old man now he I had it coming <laughs> and so um so I so but all my buddies are like oh I'll kick his ass Dave stop stop so, you know so I'm like okay so I stop and I get out and I go back and I start you know and this guy's like you really want some of this I'm like oh yeah I want it all and this guy's about 40 years old right and he beat me like that redheaded stepchild I mean just took me apart like no person had ever beat me before and just pounded me you know and finally, he just, I think he got tired of the game. <laughs> and, and he went back in the house. And I was like, geez, I, I'm it's like in Rocky four. Right. And I'm like, oh, I must be too drunk. Right. In my head. I'm like, I must have drank way too much or something, you know. So I, anyway, I did have some sense of decency about me, though. So I woke up the next morning and in the midst of like looking at my face thinking, wow, that, that looks a lot like hamburger now. I, I, I thought to myself, that was really wrong what I did. You know, I should go clear this thing up. So. I drove back to the guy's house and uh, knocked on the door and he's like, do you come back for more? And I'm like, <laughs> no, not exactly. I came to measure your lawn. I'm going to fix the sod that I ruined. That was, I, I, I was wrong. I was drinking and I was wrong and I, I want to fix it. He's like, really? I'm like, yeah. So he let me measure it and I went and bought sod and I brought it back and he was like, I didn't think he'd come back. And I was like, no, I'm here to fix it. And so I started fixing it and he's like, well, I'll help you. And we started talking he, and, and a couple of minutes later, he's like, you know, he goes, you're, you're, more than half tough. He goes like, you, you know, you put up a pretty good fight, but you never really had a chance. And I was like, <laughs> well, yeah, apparently. Um, he says, you know, but no, he goes, really? He goes, have you ever heard of Marvin Hagler? And I go, and Marvin Hagler is a middleweight champion back then in the eighties. And I'm like, yeah, I know who Marvin Hagler is. Everybody knows who Marvin Marvelous is. Marvin. That's right. <laughs> and he goes, well, yeah, I trained him for about eight years. 
<laughs> awesome. So the, the really cool end of the story is he's like, you know, if you ever want to put your hands together, I'll show you. So he, he, uh, he ended up training me for a couple of years and helped me out a lot. And during that ensuing time, they passed a law. You had to be uh, 21 to be sponsored by a beer cigarette company. So I launched my sponsorship and that led into the next portion of my career, which was going into the military. And then I got out of the military um, uh, and went to, immediately to work um, in drug enforcement in uh, Central and South America uh, in the late 80s. And then I did task forces in the United States as well, but I spent most of my time down there and uh, then came back from that and, and decided that, you know, I'd gotten shot a couple times and thought, you know, there's probably better things to do with my life. And came back to Idaho where I, where I began in earnest building businesses and um, really trying to lay down the basis of what this company is today and understanding persuasion. Don't you feel like Dave's backstory was written as like to punk the rest of us for having <laughs> pussy lives? <laughs> <laughs> what else can we throw in there? It's, uh, it, you know, so, so here, here's the real truth, right? Like there, when, when I got, when they laid their hands on me and prayed to me, I, it, 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 for me, it didn't, didn't occur to me that I like, I didn't literally believe I was going to die, but in the back of my mind, I sort of thought I was dead by the time I was 25. I sort of had that like belief, like that's probably going to happen, but I didn't put those two things together for whatever reason in my mind. Like maybe that's where that came from. But so I just, I, so when I left home, I was just like, I'm going to say yes to everything. Like if, if somebody says yes, you know, Hey Dave, do you want to, you know, do this crazy thing? Yes. It's like that Seinfeld anything? episode with George Cassandra. <laughs> Yeah. Was there anything that you had to say no to that it was just too far? You're like, oh, I can't do that. Or were you like 100% yes? A donkey like, I show. Really, I, I, was, I was really clear around certain things sexually and that kind of thing. You know, like I'm, <laughs> I, I know I'm not gay. I'll never be gay. So and nothing wrong with people who are, but it's not me. So like that was like, I was like, I don't need to go down that path to know that it's not me. I already know that. But so generally, no. Like e even when I was in law enforcement, like this, this is how stupid I was. Like they would come up and they would say, hey, we've got this new, we've got this new um, non-lethal weapon. It's called the Prowler Fowler. And <laughs> the Prowler Fowler shoots a one inch bag. It was leather, you know, a leather bag of clay pellets using the shotgun, using a shotgun shell, right? So as the <laughs> igniter, basically. So I'm like, eh, I don't know about that. I'm like if it'll stop me, right, then I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll go with it. Right. So and they're like, okay. So they, I go charging at this guy and he fires this thing at me from like <laughs> seven feet away. And, and so just in case you're interested and, and you're also I curious enough to know, you know, do I want to try this myself? Um, probably don't. It definitely <laughs> works. It knocks the living <laughs> hell out of you. And, uh, and I mean, it just like took me off my feet and I'm like sitting there, I can't breathe. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that one worked. <laughs> you know, but that, that was me. So I would say yes to those kind of things. I said yes to we had these things called stinger grenades and you set in a, they're usually used inside of an enclosed space and particularly in prisons, they're used in cells because they have concrete walls. Basically think about taking um, a punch and punching out the side of your tire in your car and getting little things about the size of a small steely and then packing 500 of those into a grenade. And I said, I don't know about that. I mean, yeah, it'll sting, but is it really going to, you know, <laughs> So I, so I sit down in the middle of a prison cell and goes, throw one in. And I, I was smart, right? Like I had goggles. No, on I, don't, I, don't know that that's, I don't know that you can say that. <laughs> Johnny when rejects your the, theory. When they yeah. threw the grenade at me, I was smart about it. Yeah. So I, so I, I, but I had on like long sleeves, long pants, boots, and I put on goggles, right? And I'm thinking to myself, this isn't going to, I mean, it's going to hurt, but it's not going to hurt that bad. And it, it just, That's how Dave feels about life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, so just imagine if you can, all of a sudden, sitting down in the middle of the largest hornet's nest you've ever seen um, and getting stung simultaneously by 500 hornets who then circle around and then sting you again just for fun. And <laughs> that's about what this was like. And so, so you know, and, and I'm just like, I'm completely disoriented. There's absolutely like, if anybody wanted to come in at that moment, steal my wallet, slap my face, whatever they wanted to do, they could have easily done it. And I was just like, oh my God, this is painful. So it was, it was actually much worse than I imagined. So, but those are the kind of things. So I just said, yes. And, and then a, a week later, they're like, Dave, we got this thing called a rectal wrecker. You want to try it yeah. out? 
<laughs> exactly. It's, I think that's the anal intruder from uh, <laughs> Top Secret. But uh, yeah. So, well, a very rare Top Secret reference in 2018. <laughs> I saw that. So, um, the uh, yeah. Well, glad glad to glad you could actually uh, 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 you know. Yeah. Have you seen Val Kilmer lately? By the way. Oh my God. Yeah. That was rough. We should talk more about persuasion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but anyway that yeah i mean going to that though that really became my whole thing and i said yes and and and, and here's the, the the sad end of that story is like i woke up at 25 and was like wtf well wait a minute it's you can actually that. say I'm what the fuck on the show if you want yeah, to okay i'm like you know like I, well, I guess i'm 25 until you know technically midnight or something so it could still happen and then and then i sort of had to reinvent where i thought the trajectory of my life was at 25 so uh, and then and then what did you do like, well what was... in, in that i mean i was still in law enforcement at that time and i did that for a little bit longer and I, some of the first companies i built were you know like swat team training companies and that kind of thing but i really had doubled down on this whole idea of understanding persuasion and influence and really understand because i it, partially because i really wanted to learn how to sell things and so i i thought well i already know something about persuasion i've spent a lot of years studying this already let me see how that actually applies to sales and so i turned it into that and then, and then, you know, I sort of became an entrepreneur at that point. And I, I wrote my first book not too long after that, which was an anthology that I wrote with some other people um, around hiring. And, and, you know, I wrote a bunch of different books after that around persuasion. But that was sort of the turning point for me where I said, okay, I'm, I've got to, you know, and I, I remember I built my first million dollar company and I was still on a SWAT team and I was changing clothes coming back from a, you know, from a call out in my car while I was driving to go to a meeting so that I could sell some more stuff. And, you know, I was like, okay, I've got to make some decision here about what I do with the rest of my life. And, and so I left law enforcement at that, you know, about that time. And, and then that was sort of the end of it. But I, I thought I could have the best of both worlds forever. I would, you know, do this thing that I, I absolutely fell in love with military and law enforcement. I mean, it was what I loved doing. And, you know, I always have, I still have fantasies today of like, maybe one of these days, you know, I'll, I'll just give this all up and go back to that. And You're like Batman. Then I'll, <laughs> yeah, I'm like Batman, except older and fatter. And so, uh, you know, so, you know, you have those thoughts, but you know, those, those are the things, but, but all of those Dave, do you have fantasies parents? about going back to the gas station? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's also not a bad, a bad fantasy either. You know, there's also <laughs> reading time in it. <laughs> so the we, we were talking before about persuasion and the ninety yeah. like the ninety percent truth is uh, I hadn't heard it framed that exactly that way before and that really is an amazing way to think about it. So in, within the context of a story, that's like veracity, right? Like I can yeah. believe this, and then I can be taken on this journey and and agree to suspend some disbelief because you you brought me in first. So what what would you say are like if in terms of like off the page stuff, getting somebody to buy the next book, getting them to join your t tribe of loyal fans who will go out and tell everybody about you. What, what would you suggest there? Yeah. So the, so the best thing you can do is invite them into your world, your, your literal real world and you know, start building a community of people, you know, give them special access, give them things. So one, one, you know, one of the, the big um, laws and persuasion is the law of reciprocity. If I, if I give you something, you're much more likely to want to give me something in return. So if it, a, a literal thing, but it can be as simple as a compliment too. And so one of the things writers can do, for example, is release short stories, novellas, that kind of thing that they only give to their fans. And they let their fans just say, you know, if you love this, you can share it with one other person, but I don't want this to get out widely, you know? So it feels like they're, they're getting something really good. Well, then the next time that, you know, it comes around to time to buy a book, they're like, oh yeah, he did give me these couple of things. I really, you know, I think I'll buy this next book. I mean, that's like okay. a simplistic yeah. sort of way of doing it, but. Well, I think we, I mean, that's something that we've done for a long time is, you know, they're, they're cookies. You give your reader mm -hmm. cookies, yeah. but I think to the point of persuasion, a way to like bring this home closer is that in those stories, you already know that I, I think an, an author's tendency would be, I'm creating the short story of this novella. Even if it's only going to these people, I'm going to tell a wide version of that story that will appeal to everybody. Mm -hmm. When what you really should be doing is telling a tiny version of that story that's yep. going to appeal to the people who said that they wanted it. Right. So it's like, be more narrow, be more yep. specific. Once you've decided that you're going to partition off this little group of people, like speak in a quieter voice to them. 
you know, yeah, use it, your indoor they're voice. In the know. Yeah, yeah, they're in the know and they get, a, they get a good piece of that. But then they're much more likely to share. But then if you like, you know, if you share some idea like, hey, I'm in this really cool place writing today or, you know, I had this really bizarre thought. What do you think? You invite them to engage and interact with you. The more you do that, the more they become, they be, the, the more they begin to feel like they're part of your process. And so anything you do, they want to be a part of, including buying the next book. And if you've, you know, and if you also hide like Easter eggs and things like that in the book mm. that only those best readers know about, and then you sort of tie back to that in conversations you're having like this on your podcast or whatever it is, you know, people are like, oh, I know what he's talking about. That was that little thing on, you know, chapter seven of this one book that nobody else got, but I got it. I, I know, I know what that is. You do those kinds of things and these people become so engaged with you. And, and then you just simply, you know, once, once you've got that kind of engagement going, you build it out. You ask them, who else do you know who's like you? That's, that's the recruitment part of cult building, right? It isn't to say, bring in your friends and family. Of course, that's a given, right? It's going out beyond that and saying, who else is like you? And then you're just having them reach out to those people like them and say, I know you like this thing. And so you'll probably like that. And then they give your book away or they, you know, they introduce them to you somehow, however they do that. Um, or they and, marry you or they marry you <laughs> indeed the other thing you know and, and a lot of authors you know like book signings used to be such a big deal right and and that was a legitimate thing to do now it's not I mean it's not illegitimate now but it's just it's not as effective as it once was right unless mm -hmm. you're a really really good marketer to fill up stores and that kind of thing. well that's because you can leave a message for the author on Facebook it's right. just different yeah it's just different right but if you invite people you know, in, in, a, in a way that, is, that feels like they're really unique and special. Like, hey, listen, I'm coming to your town, and which you can do very easily now on Facebook and, you know, any other social media. I'm coming to your town, and this is only for my, for my most important readers. Now what we're doing is we're creating exclusivity, which is another big rule of persuasion, and we're also making them unique, right? We're, we're you know, we're now, we've now put kind of a frame around them and said, you're a unique and special person in this group of people. So I'm only in, you know, I'm inviting you and I'll let you bring one friend with you. And we're going to do it at this top secret location. Don't tell anyone, you know, because I only have room for, you know, 55 people. And now they've suddenly have started to feel like they've been exalted and elevated in a specific way. They are also exclusive because not, not, not just anybody can get in. It's not at Barnes and Noble right? It's this unique place. And he's only telling a few people who really are on the, you know, you're putting these people in the inner circle, you're making them special. And that's exactly what happens in cults, right? You pull people in, you give that you imbue them with some special power and you tell them that they're special. And then you, you have examples of their specialness, right? Like showing up at this special book signing, right? And maybe even giving them, you know, for free or letting them buy, a week early or something like that, copies of your next book, right? They're the very first ones, right? I, they, they become your most rabid and biggest fans because of that. Another mistake that I see people making is not communicating with their readers enough, you know, not staying in touch with them often enough, not creating that conversation outside of the, the world you've created in the book. Because, you know, here, here's the bad news, everybody. Like, as much as we would like people to only read our books, that's not true. They're, if they love your books, they're looking for 10 more like it while you're trying to write your next one because they want that feeling to stay there. So if we can stay engaged with them and keep them focused on us, they won't forget to get the next book and they'll be engaged when it comes out. But can we forbid them to read other books as part of the cult? <laughs> you can. You absolutely can. Yeah, you absolutely can. And you can tell them exactly like, you know, why other things, you know, like you can even have a character, right? This is a, this is a great persuasive sub narrative, right? You can have a character who rejects your biggest competitor, you know? <laughs> like hard rejects, right? And just write that in like, Oh, I remember the foolish days when I used to read blah, blah, blah. Dean yeah, these guys have these ass. guys these guys have that going with Applebee's. They've got an Applebee's rivalry. We do. It, it, goes, it goes back to episode one of yesterday's gone too. 
<laughs> they don't really have a rivalry, but man, would you think they did? Yeah. I really wish Applebee's. I I want a rivalry. I want Applebee's to care. Then we could go to acknowledge us. Yeah, but they don't care. Applebee's Notice doesn't care. We're like fuck Applebee's. Applebee's is like you, who you, said you just, what? You, you took that advice of starting a war to get a publicity fire going, but you picked the wrong, like Applebee's. No, get, go after like Planned Parenthood or something inflammatory. Oh no, my. I just need to double down. Our next book. Hey Dave, no, how I'm about just it? saying like those. Our are next the, book is just called Fuck Applebee's. That's the name of the book. <laughs> are you with me, Dave? No, I don't mind Applebee's. <laughs> <laughs> That's so sad. Pick something with no controversy around it and rally. <laughs> um, <laughs> then you can build your tribe. Don't you hate Applebee's too? <clears throat> all right. So what is, the, what is the biggest mistake that you see people making when they're tr- – because we've all seen people who are trying to persuade and they're just assholes. They're bullies. They're not listening. Yep. And, and good persuasion is – it's smooth. I mean, it's spreading butter on bread. So what's the right. bullshit yeah. that people do? Well, so, so the bullshit people do is manipulate, right? They, so they try and so instead of just understanding that, like, for example, the law of reciprocation says, if I give you something, you're going to be more inclined to like me and you're going to, you know, be more inclined to do something in return for me. They, they, they approach it as tit for tat. You know, I gave you this <laughs> thing. Now I want this other thing back, you know, and, and then they act. Do they, they use words like quid pro quo? Quid pro quo, exactly. Yes, yes, and 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 they use them with, with very Latin esque uh, accents when they do it. But they, uh, you know, but ultimately that you know they do things like that, or or they just make it so obvious that they're trying to persuade you to do something, right? Because you know, obvious persuasion is second rate persuasion, right? The thing about it is, you should just naturally flow into the very next thing I want you to do, because I because I've set it up so well that you didn't even notice that it was happening. And the problem with persuasion that you can see is that it's easy to counter, right? So if, you know, it's, the, it's like going into the car lot and, the, and, you know, the guy going, let me turn the contract around now and hand you the pen. Oh, you don't <laughs> like the price? Let me go and talk to my manager and you know he's going to get a cup of coffee. Wait, let that's not real? That. <laughs> let me write a number on a sheet of paper and then push it toward you. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and everybody gets that, right? And so, so, they, so, so people imagine, and especially now, you know, with access to... I mean, anybody who wants to know how to buy a car can go on the internet and figure out every way somebody I might. I bought my it. last car by email. Did you? I, I really did. I, yeah, I didn't even want to go to the lot. I had them bring it to my, my front door. <laughs> like, I got a good price and I'm like, hey, I'll pay, I'll, I'll pay today. You just got to bring me, bring me the car. Beautiful. See, that's the, but, but you've, you've completely countered any attempt to persuade you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No, I, 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 I and, made and the argument. Yeah, and potentially left money on the table because you didn't make any attempt to persuade them to charge you. But, yeah, but I, I knew like, okay, here's the bottom line on this price. If they'll take it, awesome. I sent in an email. I made my argument. They came back. I, I, it was more important that I have to waste a fucking day. Of I tried that and was unsuccessful after hearing <laughs> John's story. Yeah, so, which, which is great. But that's, that's that whole thing that if, you know, if people are trying too hard with persuasion, if they're making it too obvious, or, or they're not even trying to be persuasive. Like you said, if they're bullying and browbeating you and stuff like that, that's, you know, it, I mean, you can, you can break anybody down for a moment, but it's not going to last. And when they come back, they're going to come back at you hard, you know, so, and they're going to tell everybody what an asshole you are and then write the bad reviews and everything else. So, so let's say you know, you're, you, you know persuasion, uh, you are uh, a master at it. Where is the line? Because um, the thing I worry about like if, if I knew all the persuasive techniques is like, mm-hmm. how am I sincere any longer? If I know that I can get anybody to do anything, what, what, what is the check on that? How am I, how am I genuine? How do I build an actual relationship with somebody? Uh, you know, barring the, b- barring you being in a small minority of sociopaths or psychopaths, most people really, once they learn persuasion, like they see it happening all around, people say, oh my God, it must be impossible to sway- persuade you. I'm like, no, I'm actually probably the easiest person to persuade because I'm fascinated by the process. And if I, and if I even notice it happening, I'm like, okay, I want to see where this goes, right? I become- I, I'm like that with most religion, by the way. I want to see where they're going to go. <laughs> we're, we're, yeah, I'm with, go. Look, I know I, a lot I, I of story tricks, shortcut. but I, I know story tricks for a living. It doesn't mean right. I don't love watching a story I'm before I go to bed every night. All the time. Yeah. Right. Like stuff right. that I should see coming. Right. Right. And right. I'm a pretty but persuasive person. And, mm-hmm. exactly. But I'm not like manipulating people into right. ma- machinations. Right. It's different. Right. And, and so that's the thing. Like, I mean, we all have some sort of moral compass, hopefully. 
and that moral compass is going to dictate. Dave, would you like them. to list people who don't have a moral compass right now? Uh, we don't have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying the moral compass always points true north, but I'm saying that, <laughs> that most people have a line that they're unwilling to cross. And, and for most of us, generally in a you know, traditional acceptable society, that line is, is reasonable for most, for the biggest majority of the population. So, so you don't go around thinking, you know, and, and do I get butt hurt sometimes? Like when somebody doesn't, you know, like, succumb to my machinations when I want a better deal on my car. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, I'm like, you, you know, you're broken psychologically. My little psychological trick didn't work. You're just a jerk, you know, which in reality is not true. Like some people are just like clear, like this is my thing. But at, at the end of the day, I think we all do sort of have that place where we're unwilling to cross if we're, if we're not inherently evil somehow, like we're not going to cause people to do things that would cause them great harm or something like that. If they, you know, if you're not the kind of person who does that thing. So, so most people have a good internal editor that gets them, you know, gets them there. And, and really what they're looking, you know, here's the thing about most people and persuasion. They learn two or three tricks that work really well for them. And they feel like, oh my God, I'm the most persuasive person ever. That's all I ever need to know. And if, it, you know, anything else that doesn't work is okay. And I'm great with this because it feels good when I do it, it works. I notice it and I'm happy, you know, and, and it probably works the few times they need it to, you know, like I need to get a phone call returned or I need to, you know, do something else. By the way, you, you know, so here's the flip side of persuasion and writers. When you teach salespeople how to open loops and leave them open on voicemail, this is the most amazing thing they've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean people? Holy crap. They actually have to call you back because you left them curious and, and, and they don't know what's coming next. And now they have to call you back. I'm like, yeah, that's all you have to do. That's just really simple. Writers have done this forever. <laughs> salespeople didn't though. I would, I would like to personally yell at everybody that leaves a voicemail. Hey, call me back. <laughs> hey, call me back. Yeah, exactly. I hate, I never call them back. Fuck them. Yeah. Have you ever called anybody back after they've said, Hey, call me back? No, no. I Liar. refuse. <laughs> I've said, Hey, call me back. Only you. you. Back. You're different. I trust you. Okay. Let's... Oh, that's the mistake. <laughs> All right. So, um, if, if you, if you enjoyed Dave, come to the summit. <laughs> if you enjoyed either Dave. I like um, that hard sell, Johnny. Yeah, well, I'm trying to be persuasive. So tickets are on yeah. sale, smarterartistsummit.com. But um, uh, f you make a fascinating guest, Dave, I got to say, since, 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 I mean, for non-family, right? It's like, like it's, yeah, yeah, if yeah, you're I'm not like funny, then, uh, <laughs> but, but yes, but this, is, this has been great. Thank you so much for being on. Um, very, very cool. So, so thanks. Do we have a website or anything? I'm super stoked and I'm really excited to be there with you guys in uh, uh, February. Is there anything you want to tell people about, Dave? Me personally, yeah, yes. a website no, or a book just, that you come. Oh, well, oh, sure. I mean, if you guys want to read one of my books, you can uh, read Persuasion: The Art of Getting What You Want, um, or Subliminal Persuasion. If you want something a little deeper, my most misunderstood book and uh, probably most negatively commented on because people just didn't get it. Dumb bad. But anyway, <laughs> uh, it's actually that happens us too. The there. subliminals yeah. didn't work on them, I guess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, well, let me then let me close with one final question. This is you know a lot about cults and conspiracies yeah. and what's going on with the world. Is our Dave right? Is your Dave right about? Is our Dave right? No, just in general. Oh, like, in general? yeah. You, no, can, you can probably confirm clearly. or deny all the shit that he no. thinks is wrong. Yeah, he's, he's, yeah, I think he's brilliant. Um, we'll, probably, we'll probably have more than one or two cocktails uh, together. Oh, imagine. he doesn't drink unless I'm, you're down with wine coolers. Then he might partake. I don't wine. know if Dude, I'm being persuaded I, I, right I, now. I, or... I, will go, I will go back to Zima just for Dave. <laughs> <laughs> they even make oh Zima God. anymore? <laughs> yeah, put that on the sales page. <laughs> They're going to be drinking Zima in the corner. That's awesome. Exactly. <laughs> We got to do that, Dave. We, we, Zima we, at night. At some point, we got to have a Zima night. There's a uh, Double Dave's pizza chain here in uh, Austin. I'm, I'm <laughs> Is there really? Yeah, Double Dave's. I'm down with that. I'll give you the shortcut to uh, all of your religious wanderings when you uh, when when we're together. Awesome. He he's decided what's the one right religion. <laughs> I think Dave has a soulmate. This is good. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much. All right. For well, Dave, on. we'll see you in two minutes, and other Dave, we'll see you. I'm sure um, in Utah or something soon. And, soon, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Thanks for joining us. Take awesome. care. Thank you, guys.